Welcome to our continuing discussion of Isaiah in this roundtable series. I'm Victor Ludlow, a professor of ancient scripture at BYU, and I welcome three colleagues with me here today as we discuss the writings of Isaiah, particularly chapters 52 and 53. Across the table from me is Jeff Chadwick from the Church History Department. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you. And to his right is Richard Draper, who is one of our esteemed colleagues here in the Ancient Scripture Department. Richard, welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. And to my left is Paul Hoskison, a longtime friend and colleague here in the college. We're glad to have you with us today, Paul. Victor, it's great to be here. Thank you. Our topic of discussion is the chapters 52 and 53 of Isaiah. Uh, I don't know how we can do this justice in one sitting here, but we'll do the best we can. Uh, these two very important chapters are both about the Lord and quoted by the Lord himself as part of his resurrection ministry recorded in 3 Nephi. First of all, chapter uh, 52 is one of these chapters quoted by the Lord in basically in 3 Nephi chapter 20. And uh, it sets the stage for some important uh, prophecies and teachings that Isaiah would give, excuse me, that the Savior would give there in 3rd Nephi. Uh, what do we see in these chapters that seems to be so powerful and so relevant that the Savior would make such strong use of them? Any ideas? Well, I would, I would say this. Uh, we are at the heart of the book of Isaiah right here as we see this very powerful witness of the servant, or as we say, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, just speculating, but we know that uh, after the resurrection, the Lord appeared to do two disciples on their way to uh, Emmaus. And uh, one of the things he did was he opened up the scriptures so that they could really understand the testimony of the Lord within the pages of the but Old Testament. He didn't just open up the book. He, was, right. he was opening up the understanding. Reve yeah, revealing that book. so their minds became, oh, yeah, that's exactly yeah. right. And I cannot help but feel if there were any portions that he quoted at that time, it would have been these, these uh, verses or these chapters right here. This, this is where it's at. You know, Richard, it's interesting, too, because when you consider what Jesus could have taught just from his own collection of teachings that he had to, uh, uh, to the Nephites as he visited them as the risen Lord, that he would spend the little bit of time he had quoting from Isaiah is an indicator of how important it must be and how important it must be that we, uh, that we study this. Right after quoting Isaiah 52 in 3 Nephi 20 uh, and, and on through 21 and 22, we have the Savior in 3 Nephi 23 saying, you ought to search these things. A commandment I give you that you search these things diligently for great are the words of Isaiah. He spake as touching all things concerning my people which are of the house of Israel. Therefore, it must needs be that he speak also unto the Gentiles. And, yeah. and that, that we are studying Isaiah in this setting, I think, is most appropriate because it's something the Savior has required of our hands. And, and, the, and the one chapter of Isaiah, about a third of Isaiah is quoted in the Book of Mormon, but the one chapter that is quoted more often by more people in the Book of Mormon is this 52nd chapter. Uh, Nephi quotes from it, Jacob quotes from it, Abinadi does extensive uh, citations from it, the Lord Jesus Christ, even Moroni at the end as he's kind of wrapping things up uh, alludes, alludes to, Isaiah to 52. some of these passages from chapter 52. So let's, let's talk about these first two uh, verses because they were not only important to the ancient prophets, but Joseph Smith used them as the subject matter to one of his question and answer sections of the Doctrine and Covenants. Yeah, let me just interject, if you don't mind, that uh, there is a natural flow from 51 into 52, as we uh, said last, uh, at our last uh, session, that the, the Lord in 51 is, is inviting Israel. They are to hearken, they are to come, they are to listen. And therefore, 52 uh, begins with, again, this, this awake, come forward, come unto me. Yes, awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Uh, does one of you have uh, section 113 of the Doctrine and Covenants there? Uh, as, as Israel is invited to wake up and put on her beautiful garments and become a holy city and so forth, uh, Joseph Smith asked the Lord what 
does this mean for Zion to put on thy strength? Uh, this is in verse 8 of, of section 113. Paul, would you read that for us? He had reference in speaking of these verses to those whom God should call in the last days, who should hold the power of priesthood to bring again Zion and the redemption of Israel. And to put on her strength is to put on the authority of the priesthood, which she, Zion, has a right to by, by lineage, also to return to that power which she had lost. Okay, so that's the invitation of Isaiah to Israel to put on their strength and is to be worthy to receive these blessings of the priesthood and some of these other things that would be lost with their apostasy. I, I, the, I think there's some nice poetry here too in, in, verse, uh, fifth, in ver, uh, verse 2 here of 52. That is, uh, using the metaphor again that we've mentioned in previous sessions of the husband and the wife and how the wife will eventually be, even though she's left her husband, uh, um, the God of Israel, he's going to invite her back. And so in verse, uh, verse 2 we have, shake thyself from the dust, arise. That is, get out of your mourning, get out of the dirty situation you're in, and, and uh, come into the house. And I'm going to read a lot into this, which I think the poetry uh, allows. Uh, come into the house, take a bath, put on the beautiful garments that I've been saving for you, all of these well, <laughs> hundreds of years. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, O oh, Jerusalem, loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O oh, captive daughter of Zion, and be my wife again. Mm -hmm. It's interesting there that in verse 3, he's playing off of an image from Isaiah 50, where in Isaiah 50, he had asked Israel, uh, or, or, or said essentially, for your own iniquities, you've sold yourself. Now in Isaiah 52, verse 3, he says to Israel, uh, you sold yourselves for naught, for nothing. You went to, into apostasy and, and, and it, was, it was for nothing. Ye shall be redeemed without money. It is not money or any physical buying or any physical salvation that can save Israel. It is the Lord's efforts. Yeah, we, yes. we probably ought to say on that one, that with which she was redeemed was not money, but it was blood. Yes. That's right. Now, before we leave verse 2, this is another subject matter of one of these uh, questions in, while you're there in section 113, Paul. Uh, to loose herself from the bands uh, of her neck there, kind of in the middle of that verse. Uh, verse 10 of section 113, what's the meaning of that phrase? We are to understand that the scattered remnants are exhorted to return to the Lord from whence they have fallen which if they do, the promise of the Lord is that he will speak to them or give them revelation. See the 6th, 7th, and 8th verses. The bands of her neck are the curses of God upon her or the remnants of Israel in their scattered condition among the Gentiles. The sins which they have taken upon themselves uh, become their bands and their bonds. And it's interesting that you me mention their scattered situation because verses 4 and 5 allude directly to that. Verse 4 mentions my people who went aforetime to Egypt to sojourn there. And of course the Lord brought them out of Egypt via the Exodus and established them in the Holy Land. But verse 4, second phrase, the Assyrian oppressed them without cause. Referring to the scattering of Israel hundreds of years later in the 8th century and now in verse 5 it talks about the problem that the people is taken away for naught. Verse 6, therefore my people shall know my name. Therefore they shall know in that day, meaning our day, that I am he that doth speak. Behold, it is I. And how will the Lord know that? Leads into that beautiful verse 7. Yes. Oh, verses 7, 8, 9, and 10. Some of the most classic poetic passages of Isaiah. Uh, Richard, would you read verses 7 and 8 for us, please? Be happy to. How beautiful upon the mountain are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice, with the voice together shall they sing, for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. Maybe I should have asked you to sing these <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> verses. Yeah, that's uh, Because it just echoes, doesn't it? Uh, this beautiful, how beautiful upon poetry. the mountain. I want to mention two things in verse 7 that, that uh, I think most of, of our listeners will be aware of. How beautiful, the word beautiful there is the word navu. 
in Hebrew. This is where the name of the city comes from, this verse. This is where the prophet word. took this name. Right. And How he loved beautiful. this verse, too. Joseph Smith loved Absolutely, Isaiah 52, yes. 7. I think there's something else that's really interesting in here. Near the end of the verse where it says, that publisheth salvation. The word salvation there in Hebrew is Yeshua. And I, I think that's where the name Jesus comes from. That is, it's the, the yeah. Greek mispronunciation and the English mispronunciation of the Greek. Yeah. And it means his name is salvation. There's this well, kind Jesus. of thing that... Jesus yes, means that's salvation. That's the way it finally ended up. Yeah. 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 There's this kind of thing out there that, 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 that the name Jesus is taken from the Hebrew name Joshua, Yehoshua, yeah. which of course means uh, uh, something is slightly different than Yeshua means. Yeshua means salvation. And the wordplay in Matthew 1, he shall be called Yeshua or Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. It's an absolute perfect wordplay. Yes, and, and uh, I'm glad you mentioned that in verse 6 because it's in verse 6 where he says, they shall know my name. And in mm -hmm. verse 7, he gives it to them, Yeshua. Isn't it interesting how this verse is important not only in Isaiah and the Old Testament and in the New Testament, but in the latter days, in terms of the Doctrine and Covenants and Joseph Smith even taking the name Nauvoo from this verse, but also in the Book of Mormon. Yeah, this is the, uh, the wicked uh, priests of King Noah, in, in trying to trap him, uh, to uh, trap Abinadi, uh, ask Abinadi what these verses mean. And they quote verses 7, 8, 9, and 10. And that's the perfect lead-in. They could not have been more inspired <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> to <laughs> to bring their own doom upon themselves by asking that question. And okay. that's exactly the question that Abinadi wants to answer them and to tell them about. Okay. That, that particular issue of trying to entrap uh, Abinadi with this is, is, is almost as divinely, uh, inspiredly foolish as trying to trap Christ himself by Absolutely. quoting scripture. Absolutely. It's amazing. And so let's, as, as, as we move then from chapter 52 to 53, first of all, the, the end of chapter 52, starting in verse 13, is the last and the most magnificent of the four servant songs of Isaiah. It's often called the suffering servant song. And it starts in verse 13 of chapter 52, carries on through the entire chapter 53, that Abinadi quotes there in Mosiah chapter 14 in the Book of Mormon. Um, I'd like to say something a little bit about the Hebrew text here, if, I, if I may. Uh, at least in the uh, Dead Sea Scroll version of Isaiah, there's no break between the end of 52, chapter 52 and the beginning of chapter 53. That's to remember. Just that is, that, one that you read uh, 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 chapter 52 verse 13 through the rest of chapter 53. It's That's all, all one unit. One unit. At least the, the first couple of verses of 53 and the end of 52 are all one unit in the Dead Sea Scroll version of Isaiah. Also, in, uh, uh, th this is a, a detailed description of who the Messiah is going to be, and we've already discussed in other episodes about the multiple uh, use of the term servant uh, applying to Christ and to Israel and to Israel in the latter days as being the servant of the whole world. And therefore, I think Isaiah, is, 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 uh, being literate and um, highly educated as he is, is making an attempt here to bring out different aspects of who the Messiah is going to be and who Israel is going to be. So, you know, Paul, um, before you continue with that, too, you can see that, that this question is, is, is there because in, in the book of Acts, in chapter, in chapter 8 of Acts, when the Ethiopian uh, Jew asks Philip, quoting this passage and saying, who is the prophet speaking of, himself or some other man? So there was, there was, uh, it was a little unclear in this particular one just who we regard the servant as being. Yeah. And of course, Philip said, "Well, let it's me tell the you, the Messiah." <laughs> All right. yeah, and let, let me just interject one one other thing. What we've done in 51 and 52 uh, is we have this uh, tremendous triumph, but that triumph ends with with verse 12 and with verse 13. Now we're going to get what it cost the Lord to bring about that triumph. Yeah. The triumphal servant had to pay a price. That's exactly right. So here's the price. So beginning in verse 13, we get this wonderfully positive statement about who the Messiah is going to be. My servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. And then strangely, the very next verse seems to say that that he's not going to be exalted and very high. If you read the King James Version, and which, which is a good translation from the uh, Masoretic Hebrew text, and many were astonished at thee, 
His visage was so marred more than any man in his form, more than the sons of men. Everywhere else in the Bible where the word visage and form occur, it's always positive. It's never negative. Only this verse seems to be using them negatively. And that's partly because of the reading of the word marred in this verse. Uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls version, again, of Isaiah, this is read differently than marred. It actually reads there, anointed. So the verse there in the Dead Sea Scrolls reads, and many were astonished at the, his visage was uh, was anointed more than any man, and his form more than the sons of man. In other words, it turns into a very positive uh, description of the Messiah as being the anointed one to parallel the positive uh, description of him in verse 13. And then the result of all of this is described in verse 15 where um, uh, uh, in the King James where it says, so shall he sprinkle many nations. Some of the modern translations say he will startle many nations. The Joseph Smith translation uh, uh, changes that to read, um, he will gather many nations. He will nations. gather many nations, yes. Mm -hmm. and, and in fact, we are startling the nations in our gathering of the nations. Yes, I think right. they all actually work together quite well there. There's, yeah. there's something else going on here literarily with this, and that is, uh, I think Isaiah purposely used a word there for marred that has a dual meaning because he wants to make a parallel with the verse before it, that is, a positive thing, anointed. But in verse 50, uh, chapter 53, verses 1 and 2 and so forth, the image becomes a little more negative. It's going to describe some of the terrible things that happened to the Savior mm -hmm. and how people are going to view him. And therefore, I think he also uh, intended the meaning marred there in verse 14 to parallel what's going to come afterwards. This is called a Janus or parallel. Starred. I mean, he's going to be, he's, yeah. he's really, it's really going to show on him what he's going through. In the technical jargon, this is called a Janus parallelism, where you read it one way, it's parallel with what goes before it. You read it the other way, it's parallel with what comes afterwards. It's just a little example of, of how ingenious uh, Isaiah was in his poetry. Now, as we move into chapter 53, I'd like to cite a, a quote here from President Joseph Fielding Smith about this particular chapter. He says, now Bible commentators will tell you that Isaiah 53 has nothing to do with the life of Jesus Christ. To them, this, is, this story is one concerning suffering Israel. I want to tell you that it is a story, a synopsis of the life of our Redeemer revealed to Isaiah 700 years before the Lord was born. If you have the proper discernment, you will discover this. Well, what do we learn about this Jesus? In the first verses, what, uh, what kind of a person does, uh, does Isaiah seem to be describing here? Well, he's describing the king of Israel. He's describing the king of Israel taken, uh, the, the, the son of the landowner, the son of the vineyard owner, and he's being beaten and killed by the servants. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the servant here. Everywhere else we've talked about the servant in these servant poems could easily be looked at as the house of Israel that, that suffers much and triumphs for the Lord's sake, and the king of Israel, the Messiah, who sits at the head of Israel and who triumphs having suffered much for us. And, and it's important for us to remember that although our Jewish friends and even some of our biblical studies friends will see only Israel in Isaiah 53, see only the suffering servant of Israel, it is incumbent upon us, as President Smith said, to recognize there is no Israel without its king. And that right. first and foremost, this applies to the king of Israel who suffered for Israel Good. and the world. Yes. I was, just, I was just going to say one of the things that comes out of this that uh, caused Israel, that, that is to say the Jews at the time of Jesus to reject him, is that he, he was so ordinary, he was extraordinary. But in a way, you know, we know whence he is. We know his father. We know his mothers. We know his brothers. We know his, he's, he's one of us. And he was just, just a, another man from Galilee. That's exactly right. <laughs> and, and not only that, Richard, Jesus was put to death, or at least he allowed himself to be yeah. put to death, which was not at all an expectation that of Jews had of the Messiah. That's why this song was so hard to relate to the Messiah doctrine, because here the Messiah is being beaten up and put to death, and yeah. well, that's and just not an image and, they had. And, and it's called the Suffering Servant Song because just looking at him, uh, verses 3 and 4, you just you, you see the terrible suffering that he's undergoing, and, and you wonder, oh my goodness, what, what has he done that he's suffering? But as we read on, we realize his suffering is not for anything he has done, it's for what we have done. 
Now, uh, President Hunter, Howard W. Hunter, talked about this suffering aspect of, uh, as portrayed here by Isaiah. And uh, he uh, describes how, although peace was on his lips and in the heart of the Savior, no matter how fiercely the tempest was raging, may it so be with us, he says, in, in our hearts, in our homes, in our nations, and so forth. We have these kinds of buffetings and sufferings that come to us, but we cannot expect to get through life without some opposition. And so we, we, we learn from this Jesus who was not spared grief and pain and anguish and buffeting. He had to undergo this terrible suffering for what we have done. We surely must not expect that we can escape life without some kind of buffeting and suffering. But through him, we can be relieved and redeemed of this ultimate suffering. And I just want to say too, uh, on that basis, that, that uh, that's the message of 4, 5, and 6. That is to say, he suffered for us, verse, verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Mm -hmm. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are... Uh, the, the, the idea of this, this atonement. He, exa suffering. Exactly right, which is the message, of course, of, uh, of uh, chapter 53. There are certain elements of this chapter that simply cannot be reconciled with just the mission of Israel to be a light to the nations because there is actually atonement value in these. And if you don't for some reason see it in 5 and 6 and 7 where he was oppressed and afflicted and opened not his mouth where he was as a lamb to the slaughter. If you look at that and if you say, well that, that could be the house of Israel, um, uh, true, but even more so the king of Israel. It's verse 12 where you get the notion that he has made intercession for the transgressors, which was never a doctrine that the house of Israel in general was supposed to fulfill. Some groups, but not, not as a whole. And some of these other elements here of, 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 of with prisoners and his burial with the wicked and the rich and so forth, uh, you'll notice in the footnotes, of, of course, all kinds of cross-references to these gospel accounts in the New Testament, which pull these different elements and tie them together. And, and again, that, that, that one that right after verse 10, verse 11, um, my righteous servant shall justify many, he shall bear their iniquities. That's really the role of the king of Israel. Right. So what do we learn from these couple of chapters we've just talked about here? Paul? Oh, Isaiah is uh, waxing so poetically beautiful. Every time I read these verses, I, they, I just thrilled with them. Um, uh, we, we're, we learn that the Messiah, uh, we learn what his name is going to be. We learn that he's going to be born and, and uh, not esteemed and not welcomed by everyone and that he will be, uh, uh, um, have troubles in life and uh, will eventually be uh, taken as a lamb to the slaughter and open not his mouth. And, and I think uh, there in verse 10, we've, we've skipped a little bit of verse 10. Uh, I'm going to read this a little bit, uh, inserting into it a little bit of the Hebrew text. Yet it pleased Jehovah to bruise the Messiah. For Jehovah hath put the Messiah to grief when thou, shalt, when thou uh, you Israel, shall put the, the Messiah's soul as an offering for sin. And the Messiah shall see his seed. That is, he will eventually recognize the work that he has done. I mean, he's, he's already known most of that. And, and, and you have to believe that, uh, that uh, as Jesus matured in wisdom and knowledge on the earth, that he became aware of these prophecies which he had actually given of himself in the Old Testament. He and shall see the children of Christ, the natural acceptors of his, um, of his, exactly. his, his suffering. Yes. Was, as King Benjamin would say, those that become his sons and daughters, mm -hmm. his family. And, and these become his children. Uh, that is, when mm -hmm. we accept Christ, we become his children. And, and we become his spiritual family because he has paid the price for us. And therefore, in these verses, we have uh, such a beautiful poetic rendition of the atonement and what it's all about. It's, it, these are profound. I mean, this, if we only had one instead of 66 chapters of, of Isaiah, I mean, my, my vote here would be for this, this suffering servant song starting at the end of, of chapter 52, continuing on, not only for the description of the Lord and, and aspects alluding to his name and, and, and all, but particularly the, the power of 
the, the role of this servant to provide this vicarious suffering for us. I mean, he's, he's a servant of the Father in our behalf. He's not doing it for his own glory or his own vanity. He's doing it for us to bless our lives. And what a powerful imagery that Isaiah gives us in these verses. And particularly, you know, the, the accuracy also of, of the prophetic metaphors. I, I go back to verse 9. We talk about atonement. Let's remember the, the, the death part of that atonement. What it cost Christ was actually his life mm -hmm. uh, with his blood. Verse 9, he made his grave with the wicked. If he was, he was crucified between two thieves. Uh, with the rich in his death, buried in a wealthy man's tomb, the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And the New Testament brings out these ideas as it talks about That's the right. life of Christ. It does. It always, it always relates back to Isaiah yes. and the other prophecies from the Old Testament that, that show that he's the Messiah and yes. has done these things. And then others like Handel and his Messiah and others can, can draw upon these and inspire us uh, constantly. I, I don't know if we appreciate the the rich connection we can make through the scriptures and other literary forms back to these words of Isaiah some 2,700 years ago to help us understand the servant of all servants. Well, thank you for helping us to better understand and appreciate these important passages. Thank you. For more information on this program, visit our website at byubroadcasting.org.